Chapter One: A Meeting in Miami. James Bond, British Secret Intelligence Agent Number Double O Seven, was sitting in the International Transit Lounge at Miami Airport. He was drinking bourbon whiskey. Bond had arrived in Miami earlier that day after completing a dangerous mission in Mexico. Now it was evening, and he was waiting to catch the next plane to New York. Suddenly, an announcement came from the airport's loudspeaker system: "Transamerica Airlines regrets to announce that there is a delay on flight TR618 to New York. This is because there is a technical problem on the aircraft. The new departure time will be at 8 a.m. Please, will all passengers for flight TR618 go to the Transamerica ticket counter? Arrangements will be made for them to stay in a hotel tonight." Thank you. Bond finished his whiskey. What should he do? Should he try and get a seat on another flight, or should he stay the night in Miami? He looked out of the window. It was getting late. Beneath the dark purple evening sky, tiny lights were sparkling on the airport's runways. Bond heard footsteps approaching. They stopped at his side. He glanced up and saw a well-dressed middle-aged man who looked. A little embarrassed. Excuse me, but are you Mr. Bond, Mr.、Uh, James Bond? Yes. Well, I'm surprised to meet you here. The man held out his hand, and Bond stood up slowly and shook it. My name is Junius Dupont," said the middle-aged man, smiling. "You probably don't remember me, but we've met before. May I sit down?" Bond looked more closely at Mr. Dupont. The man was about fifty years old, with a smooth pink face. He was dressed in an expensive suit, the kind of suit that American millionaires wear. Yes, Bond had met him before, but where and when? We met in France in 1951, in the casino at Royal Les Eaux," said Mr. Dupont. "You were playing in an important game of cards." My wife and I were sitting next to you. Of course, Bond had been playing cards against a famous French gambler, and he'd beaten him and won a huge amount of money. Yes, of course I remember," he said, smiling. "I'm pleased that we've met here by chance. We must have a drink together," said Mr. Dupont. "What will you have? Bourbon with ice, please." Mr. Dupont called a waitress and ordered drinks. "I was sure that I recognized you," he continued. I was flying on the Trans America flight to New York tonight too. When they announced the delay, I saw the look of disappointment on your face. I went to the ticket counter and checked the names on the passenger list, and there was your name, James Bond. The waitress brought the drinks. Suddenly, Mr. Dupont leaned forward in his seat and looked around the room. Although the tables near them were empty, he talked quietly so that only Bond could hear. Mr. Bond. After that card game, I heard some things about you. I heard that you weren't only an excellent card player, but that you were also a kind of、uh, private investigator,、uh, a secret agent. Bond looked at Mister Dupont and spoke carefully. Well, I did a little of that kind of work after the war, he said. His cool gray-blue eyes did not show his feelings. But now I work for a company called Universal Export. Universal Export was not a real company, but Bond couldn't tell people the truth, so he pretended that he was employed by Universal. In fact, he worked for the British government. He was a member of the British Secret Intelligence Service. James Bond was one of the best secret agents in the SIS. Only the very best agents had work names which began with double O. A secret agent whose work name began with two zeros was always sent on the most difficult and dangerous missions, and sometimes he was ordered to kill enemies of his country. He also had permission to kill people who attacked him. James Bond, Agent Double O Seven, had a license to kill. Bond glanced at his watch. Mr. Dupont looked quickly at his own watch too. Seven o'clock already, he said. Listen, Mr. Bond, I have a problem.
and I'd like your advice. I own a hotel here in Miami, and I'd like to invite you to stay there tonight. You can have the best suite in the hotel. What do you say? Bond didn't have anything to do in Miami until he caught a plane to New York. What kind of rich man's problem does Mr. Dupont have? He asked himself. Does he have trouble with women or gangsters, or is he being blackmailed? Whatever it is, it might be interesting. So Bond decided to accept the invitation. All right, Mister Dupont, I'll stay in your hotel and I'll help you. He said, "Thank you, Mister Bond. But first, let's go and have dinner. Do you like crabs? Very much," said Bond. "Well, I'll take you to a restaurant called Bills on the Beach, which has wonderful crabs. I often eat there." The two men went downstairs to the front of the airport. Mr. Dupont's car, a shiny Chrysler Imperial, was waiting outside. Immediately, his driver ran forward and opened the doors. Bond stepped inside the luxurious car. Bill's on the beach was a very expensive restaurant, and it was clear that Mr. Dupont was a regular customer. The manager immediately welcomed Mr. Dupont and took him and Bond to a table which was in the best position. Bond drank a vodka martini. His favorite cocktail, while Mr. Dupont ordered crabs cooked in butter and bottles of pink champagne. When the food came, it was one of the most delicious meals that Bond had ever eaten. Have you ever played the card game Canasta, Mr. Bond? Asked Mr. Dupont as they sat drinking coffee. Yes, it's a good game. I like it. I like it too. I've been playing Canasta for many years, and I'm a very experienced player. But this week, I've lost twenty-five thousand dollars playing canasta. What do you think about that? Well, said Bond, if you've been playing with the same man, he's been cheating you. That's what I think too, said Mister Dupont. But I've watched him carefully, and I can't find out how he's cheating. There aren't any special marks on the cards. He never tries to look at the cards in my hand. But he just keeps winning and winning. Bond was interested in everything about cards and gambling. Twenty-five thousand dollars is a lot of money, he said. Haven't you won at all? No. As soon as a game starts going well for me, the man puts down exactly the right cards and beats me. It's as if he knows which cards I have in my hand. Are there any mirrors in the room where you play? Asked Bond. Perhaps he can see your cards reflected in a mirror. No, he can't see a reflection of my cards in a mirror," replied Mister Dupont. "We never play in a room. We always play outside. He says that he wants to stay in the sun and get a suntan, so he only wants to play cards in the mornings and afternoons. We never play in the evenings." "What's this man's name?" asked Bond. "Goldfinger." "What's his first name?" "Arik." "That means golden, doesn't it?" said Junius Dupont. He certainly looks golden. He's got hair as red as fire. What's his nationality? British, Dupont replied. He's not married. He's forty-two, and he works as a broker. I found out this information by looking at Goldfinger's passport. I own the Floridiana Hotel where he's staying, so I asked our hotel detective to show the passport to me. What does Goldfinger buy and sell? I asked him, replied Dupont. But he just said, "Oh, anything." He doesn't like answering questions. Has he got a lot of money? He's extremely rich. He's one of the richest millionaires in the world. I asked my bank to investigate him. He keeps all his money in the form of gold bars and moves them around to different countries. Junius Dupont stared at Bond for a few moments. I've never forgotten meeting you in the casino at Royale Zo," he said. I remember how you took risks as you gambled, and I remember that you stayed so cool as you played. You never looked nervous or worried, Mister Bond. I'll pay you ten thousand dollars to stay in my hotel. I want you to find out how this man Goldfinger is cheating me. That's a very good offer," said Bond. He thought for a few minutes, but I have to fly to New York tomorrow night. If you play your usual card games tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon, I should have enough time to find out the answer. Is that okay? 
That's fine, said Mr. Dupont. Chapter Two, Mr. Goldfinger. Next morning, Bond woke early. He got out of bed and walked over to the huge window of his luxurious suite in the Floridiana Hotel. He pulled back the curtains and stepped out onto the balcony and into the bright sunshine. Twelve floors below Bond was the Cabana Club, which was also part of the hotel. This building had a flat roof where guests could lie in the sun and sunbathe. There were chairs and tables and brightly coloured umbrellas on the roof. At the far end of the roof, there was a huge swimming pool with sparkling water. Hotel staff wearing white jackets were busy getting everything ready for the day. Around the hotel, there was a garden full of beautiful plants and trees. A lawn of green grass led down to a beach of golden sand, and beyond this was the bright blue sea. The hotel was in the best position on the coast of Florida. Mister Dupont's hotel must have some extremely rich guests, thought Bond, and he smiled. He went back into the bedroom, picked up the phone, and ordered a delicious and expensive breakfast. By the time that he'd shaved, had taken a cold shower, and got dressed, it was eight o'clock. Bond ate his breakfast slowly and thought about Mister Dupont and Mister Goldfinger. Bond was sure that Goldfinger was cheating Mister Dupont. But Goldfinger was already a very rich man. He didn't need to make money by cheating people at card games, so he probably cheated people in bigger ways too. Bond was very interested in the activities of big criminals. He very much wanted to meet Goldfinger. Bond had asked Dupont to get him a pass key to Goldfinger's suite. Bond wanted to look inside the suite when Goldfinger wasn't there. He wanted to find out how Goldfinger was cheating Dupont. At ten o'clock, Bond and Mister Dupont met in the garden of the hotel, and Dupont handed Bond a pass key. Then they walked over to the Cabana Club and climbed up the steps to the roof. Bond was going to pretend that he was a friend of Mister Dupont's. Mister Dupont was going to introduce Bond to Goldfinger. He was going to say that Bond had come to Miami from New York on business. Bond got a surprise when he first saw Goldfinger. At the far corner of the roof, a man was lying on a sunbed. He was wearing a very small yellow satin swimsuit and sunglasses. His skin was burned a red-brown color by the sun. "Hi there," Mr. Dupont called out loudly. Goldfinger didn't move. "He can't hear much. He's deaf," Dupont explained to Bond. They walked up to Goldfinger's sunbed. "Hi there," said Mr. Dupont again. Goldfinger sat up and took off his sunglasses. "I'd like you to meet Mr. Bond." James Bond," said Dupont. "He's a friend of mine from New York. He's here on business." "Pleased to meet you, Mister Bomb." Goldfinger held out his hand, and Bond shook it. Goldfinger's hand was hard and dry. He opened his eyes wide and stared at Bond for a moment. The millionaire's eyes were a strange, pale blue color. "Mister Bond doesn't play cards, but he would like to watch us play," said Junius Dupont. Do you want to play a game? I will go and change my clothes," Goldfinger said. "I was going to play golf this afternoon, but I'd like to play cards instead. Do you play golf, Mister Bomb? Sometimes, when I'm in Britain," replied Bond. "I've recently joined the Royal St Mark's Golf Club at Sandwich," said Goldfinger. "One of my businesses is near Sandwich. Do you know the golf course there?" "Yes, I've played at Royal St Mark's," said Bond. We must have a game there one day," said Goldfinger. Then he turned and spoke to Mister Dupont. "I'll be back in a few minutes," he said, and he walked slowly towards the steps. Mister Dupont asked the hotel staff to bring a table for cards, while Bond thought about Goldfinger. Auric Goldfinger was an extraordinary-looking man. When he'd stood up, Bond had seen that Goldfinger's sunburned body was very thick and short. His head was huge and round like a football. His hair was bright flame red, and he had pale yellow eyelashes around his pale blue eyes. When Goldfinger returned, he was wearing a dark blue suit and a white shirt. Bond noticed a skin-colored hearing aid in his left ear. Dupont and Goldfinger sat down at the card table. Dupont sat with his back to the hotel, and Goldfinger sat opposite him. Bond took a seat close to Dupont and began to watch carefully. 
The men cut and dealt the cards for the first round and began to play. Soon Goldfinger started winning. He seemed to have very good luck. He always knew which cards to play and how to beat Dupont's cards. Bond became more and more sure that Goldfinger was cheating, but he couldn't see how. How long are you staying in Miami, Mr. Bomb? asked Goldfinger. Bond smiled politely. My name is Bond. B O N D. I have to go back to New York tonight. Ah, how sad, said Goldfinger, looking down at his cards. He won that round, and the next, and the next, and then he won the whole game. So Mr. Dupont had lost one thousand five hundred dollars. Goldfinger began to deal the cards for a new game. Don't you ever sit in a different seat? Asked Bond. Unfortunately, Mr. Bond, that's not possible," said Goldfinger. "I have an illness called agoraphobia, a fear of open spaces. I can't look at open places; it makes me ill. So I have to sit and face the hotel." "Oh, I'm so sorry," said Bond. "How did your agoraphobia start?" "I've no idea," said Goldfinger, picking up his cards. Bond stood up. I think that I'll go and have a look at the swimming pool," he said. "Okay, James," said Dupont. "I'll see you at lunch." Bond walked over to the pool, then looked back at the two men playing cards. So Goldfinger liked to face the hotel, or was the truth that he liked Junius Dupont to have his back to the hotel? And why? What was the number of Goldfinger's suite in the hotel? Bond took out the passkey which Dupont had given him. The number on it was two hundred. Bond's suite was number one thousand two hundred, and it was on the top floor. So Goldfinger's suite would be ten floors directly below Bond's. Room two hundred was on the second floor, about twenty yards above the card table. Bond looked up at the balcony of Goldfinger's suite. It was empty. An open door led to the room inside. Bond stared at the doorway. Suddenly, Bond had an idea about how Goldfinger was cheating Dupont. Yes, that must be it. Clever, Mister Goldfinger. While they ate their lunch, Dupont told Bond that he'd lost another ten thousand dollars to Goldfinger. Tell me something," said Bond. "Does Goldfinger have a secretary?" "Yes," replied Dupont. "But I've never seen her. I think that she stays in his suite all the time." I think that I know how Goldfinger is cheating you," said Bond slowly. "But I have to be sure. Tell him that I won't be watching the game this afternoon. Tell him that I got bored and that I went into town." Bond went up to his suite on the top floor. He opened his suitcase and took out an M3 Leica camera with a powerful flash. Then he took out his gun, a .32 Walther PPK. At three fifteen, Bond went out onto his balcony and looked down. Far below, he could see Goldfinger and Dupont playing cards on the roof of the Cabana Club. Bond went down to the second floor and stood outside the door of Goldfinger's suite. There was nobody watching him, so he took out the pass key, opened the door very quietly, and stepped inside the suite. Bond heard a low and attractive voice, the voice of an English girl. He's just picked up a four and a five," she was saying. "Now he's getting rid of the four. He's holding a king, a nine, and a seven in his hand." Bond walked silently towards the sound of the voice. A girl was sitting on a table just inside the open door of the balcony. It was very hot in the suite, and she was wearing only black silk underwear. She was swinging her legs backwards and forwards. And painting nail polish on her fingernails, just in front of her eyes, there was a pair of very powerful binoculars on a tripod. Below the binoculars, there were wires leading to a microphone. As Bond watched, the girl switched the microphone off. So that was how Goldfinger was cheating Dupont. The girl could see Dupont's cards through the binoculars. Then she spoke into the microphone and told Goldfinger what the cards were. Her voice came through to Goldfinger on his hearing aid. In this way, Goldfinger knew exactly which cards Dupont was holding. It was a very clever trick.
Bond stepped very softly onto a chair behind the girl and looked through his camera. Yes, he could take a good picture from here. The photograph would show the girl's head, the binoculars, the microphone, and the two men playing at the card table far below. He pressed the button on the camera, and there was a powerful flash of light. The girl turned round in surprise and fear and screamed when she saw Bond. Good afternoon, said Bond. Who are you? What do you want? Don't worry. I've got a photo of everything. I know how Goldfinger has been cheating. And my name is Bond. James Bond. The girl was very beautiful, with pale blonde hair and dark blue eyes. Her skin was suntanned a light golden brown color. What are you going to do? she asked. I'm not going to do anything to you, but I might have some fun with Mr. Goldfinger. Move over and let me have a look. Bond took the girl's place and looked through the binoculars. The game was going on normally. Goldfinger's expression hadn't changed. His face wasn't showing that anything was wrong. Why does Goldfinger take risks? Cheating people like this, asked Bond. He doesn't need the money. He doesn't care if people find out that he's a cheat, said the girl. He just gives them gold. He knows that everybody wants gold, so he always takes a million dollars worth of gold with him wherever he goes. Are you Goldfinger's girlfriend? Bond asked. No, I am not, the girl said quickly. His secretary? No, a companion. I travel with him. He pays me well. Bond looked down through the binoculars again. He saw that Dupont was beginning to win. Goldfinger was sitting calmly. He was waiting for the girl's voice to come through his hearing aid again. He put his hand up to his hearing aid and pushed it more firmly into his ear. Bond watched Goldfinger's big face carefully. Then he switched on the microphone and spoke softly into it. Now listen to me, Goldfinger. This is James Bond speaking. I know that you've been cheating. I've taken a photo which shows everything the blonde, the binoculars, the microphone, and you and your hearing aid. But I won't send it to the FBI and Scotland Yard if you do exactly what I say. Nod your head if you understand. Goldfinger moved his big head slowly up and down. Put your cards down on the table, said Bond. Now take out your checkbook and write a check for $50,000. That's $35,000 for Mr. Dupont, $10,000 for me, and an extra $5,000 for wasting so much of Mr. Dupont's valuable time. Goldfinger took his checkbook out of his pocket and started to write a check. Good, said Bond. Now listen to these instructions. Book a ticket for me on a train to New York tonight. The ticket must be for a private compartment. I want a bottle of the best champagne to be ready in the compartment and lots of caviar sandwiches. Now, said Bond, give the check to Mr. Dupont and say, I apologize, I've been cheating you. Bond watched Goldfinger drop the check in front of Mr. Dupont and speak to him. What's your name? Bond asked the girl. Jill Masterton. Goldfinger had stood up and was turning away from the card table. Stop, said Bond sharply. I haven't finished with you yet, Goldfinger. There's one more thing. I'll be taking Miss Masterton with me to New York. Make sure that she's at the train. That's all. Chapter 3 The Richest Man in Britain It was a week later, and Bond was back in the headquarters of the British Secret Intelligence Service in London. He was thinking about Jill Masterton. It had been a wonderful trip in the train to New York. Bond and the girl had eaten the sandwiches and drunk the champagne. Then they had made love in the narrow bed of their private compartment. Bond had asked Jill about Goldfinger. He'd wanted to know if Goldfinger had been angry after the card game. Jill told Bond how Goldfinger had behaved. Goldfinger hadn't shown his feelings at all. In fact, the millionaire had given Jill a message for Bond. He'd said that he would be returning to Britain in a week's time and he wanted to play a game of golf with Bond at the Royal St. Mark's Golf Club. When they arrived in New York, Jill had told Bond that she was returning to Goldfinger. Bond had tried to stop her. He was worried that Goldfinger might hurt her. 
But Jill wasn't frightened of Goldfinger, and she didn't want to lose her job. Goldfinger paid her well. Bond had given Jill the ten thousand dollars that he'd got as his payment from Mr. Dupont. Then he'd kissed her once, hard on the lips, and had walked away. They hadn't been in love with each other, but they had had a wonderful time together. A red phone on the desk in front of Bond rang. This was the phone that Bond's boss M used to call him. Bond picked it up. "Come up to my office, Double O Seven," M's voice said. "Yes, sir." Bond went up to the top floor of the building. He knocked on the door of M's office and went in. M was sitting at his desk reading some papers. "Sit down, Double O Seven," M said. Last night I had dinner with the governor of the Bank of England. He told me that the bank has a serious problem with gold smuggling. The people at the bank are sure that someone is taking large amounts of gold out of Britain illegally. Do you know anything about gold? Not much, sir. Do you know who are the richest men in this country? Well, said Bond, there are some very rich businessmen. Some bankers are very rich too, and so are some members of the royal family. Yes," said M. "But there's one man who is richer than anybody else. He's called Goldfinger, Auric Goldfinger." Bond started to laugh. "What's so funny?" "Sorry, sir, but I met him last week," Bond replied, and he told M the whole story of his meeting with Goldfinger. "Well, Double O Seven," said M when Bond had finished speaking. The people at the Bank of England suspect that Goldfinger is a gold smuggler, and they want to catch him. He stopped speaking for a few seconds, then continued, "I've arranged for you to meet a man called Colonel Smithers at four o'clock this afternoon. He's the head of the Bank of England's research department. He'll tell you more about the bank's problem with Goldfinger." Colonel Smithers was a quiet, serious-looking man who wore glasses, but when he started to talk about gold. He became very interesting. He lived, thought, and dreamt about gold. He told Bond about the history of gold and its value. He said that each country has its own supply of gold. He also told Bond that there is yellow gold, red gold, and white gold. My job, Mister Bond, is to check if gold is being smuggled out of Britain. When I find out that someone is smuggling, I inform the CID Gold Squad. We try to get the gold back and arrest the smugglers, but gold attracts the biggest, cleverest criminals, and it's difficult to catch them. Can you give me an example of how gold is smuggled? Asked Bond. Yes. Imagine that you have a small bar of gold in your pocket. In this country, the price of gold bullion is controlled by the Bank of England. It's illegal to sell gold for a higher price. But if you smuggle your gold bar out of Britain to a country like India and sell it there, you can get a lot more money for it. Why is gold worth more in India? Asked Bond. India needs gold to make jewellery, replied Colonel Smithers. It doesn't have enough gold of its own. So, what is the Bank of England's particular problem? Said Bond. Our problem is a man called Auric Goldfinger, said Colonel Smithers. He came to Britain from Riga in the Soviet Union in 1937. He was a jeweler and a goldsmith. He bought lots of small jeweler shops here in Britain and gave them his name, Goldfinger. Then he started selling cheap jewelry and buying old gold. Goldfinger became very rich. The Colonel went on. After the war, he bought a house at Rakalva near the River Thames and built a small factory there. He employed German and Korean workers in this factory. Then he bought a large cargo ship and an old Rolls Royce Silver Ghost car. He also has a factory in Switzerland. Every year, Goldfinger made one trip to India in his cargo ship, and a few trips in his car to Switzerland," said Colonel Smithers. But one year there was a terrible storm, and his ship was wrecked. The ship was destroyed on some rocks. The company which collected the pieces of the wrecked ship found a strange kind of powder inside parts of the ship. When scientists examined the powder, they found out that it was gold. We were sure that Goldfinger had been smuggling gold out of Britain to India in his ship. Colonel Smithers continued, but we couldn't prove anything. 
Goldfinger does everything legally. He has plenty of money in his bank account, and he always pays his taxes to the government. I've been investigating Mr. Goldfinger for five years, and I've discovered that he's the richest man in Britain. All his wealth is in the form of gold bars. He has twenty million pounds worth of gold bars in the vaults of banks in Zurich, Nassau, Panama, and New York. I went to Nassau and examined some of his gold bars in the bank there," said the colonel. And I discovered something very interesting: Goldfinger's gold bars have no official marks on them. The bars were not produced by the Royal Mint. So where have the bars come from? Asked Bond. Goldfinger has produced his gold bars himself," Colonel Smithers replied. He has melted down old gold from his shops, smuggled it out of Britain, and made it into new gold bars. Each of his bars has the mark of a tiny letter Z on the metal. But the gold in his bars doesn't belong to Goldfinger," said Colonel Smithers. "It belongs to the Bank of England, and Britain needs that gold back as soon as possible. We need your help, Mister Bond. We want you to catch Goldfinger." M had told Bond to report back to him at six o'clock. After Bond had told his boss about his meeting with Colonel Smithers, M thought for a few minutes. "Do you have any ideas about how we can get close to Goldfinger?" he asked. "Well, I got a message that he'd like to play golf with me," replied Bond. "I could talk to him during the game. I could make up a story. I could pretend that I'm bored working for Universal Export. Perhaps he'll offer me a job." All right," said M. "Now listen, Double O Seven. There's something else that Colonel Smithers didn't tell you. I also know what Goldfinger's own gold bars look like. I saw a bar today. It was found in the office of one of Smash's agents in Tangiers. The bar had Goldfinger's letter Z on it. The Secret Intelligence Service has found nineteen of these gold bars," M went on. Each bar had been kept by a Smash agent. I think that Smash trained Goldfinger as a spy before he left the Soviet Union, and now he works for them. I believe that he's a banker for Smash. He looks after their money and increases their wealth. If I'm correct, then Goldfinger is one of Smash's best men. Chapter Four: A Trip to Sandwich. Bond decided to drive to Sandwich and play a game of golf with Goldfinger. Goldfinger had told Bond that he was a member of the Royal St Mark's Golf Club. Bond had often played on this course in the southeast of England when he was a teenager, so he knew it well. Bond drove from London to Sandwich in a grey Aston Martin DB3. This car belonged to his employers, the SIS, and it was very fast and powerful. The car also had some special features. There was a gun hidden in a secret compartment under the driver's seat, and a radio that could pick up signals from a transmitting device called the Homer. Bond was a fast driver and easily passed most of the other cars on the road. As he drove, he thought about M's last words. Bond thought that M was probably right about Goldfinger. The headquarters of Smash were in Moscow. But it had many centers around the world. The organization needed a clever banker who was working outside the Soviet Union. Goldfinger was a perfect choice for Smash. Bond had booked a room in a hotel in Ramsgate, a small town near Sandwich. A few miles from Ramsgate, he passed a signpost to Rakalva, where Goldfinger's house and factory were. Bond saw a tall factory chimney behind some trees. And then he passed a gate with a sign which said, "Thanet Alloys, no entry except on business." Bond reached the hotel at twelve o'clock. He went to his room and unpacked his bags. Then he had a drink in the bar. Later he drove to the Royal St Mark's Golf Course at Sandwich. A man called Alfred Blacking worked for the Royal St Mark's Golf Club. Bond had known Alfred Blacking for many years. Alfred's job was to teach people to play golf. He also sold and repaired golf equipment in the shop at the club. When members of the club had no one else to play with, 
they could book a game of golf with Alfred. When Bond arrived, Alfred was repairing a broken golf club in the workshop area of the shop. He was surprised and pleased to see Bond. Hello, Mr. Bond. Oh, it must be more than fifteen years since you played golf at St. Mark's. Are you going to play today? Yes. I'm looking for someone to play golf with, Alfred. Have you got time for a game this afternoon? I'm sorry, sir, replied Alfred, but a member of the club, Mr. Goldfinger, has already booked a game with me. Goldfinger, said Bond, pretending to be surprised. I met a man called Goldfinger the other day in America. Oh, said Alfred. Well, if you know him, would you like to have a game with him this afternoon instead of me? All right, said Bond. But perhaps he won't want to play with me. We'll find out now, said Alfred, looking through the window. There's his car. Bond saw a very unusual car coming towards the shop. It was a beautiful old Rolls Royce Silver Ghost. It was bright yellow, except for the roof, which was black. The sun shone on the silver metal of the radiator at the front of the car. The two great headlights on the radiator looked like two huge eyes staring at Bond. Goldfinger was sitting in the driver's seat. Beside him was a shorter man, dressed in a tight black suit, with a bowler hat placed firmly on his head. The two men stared straight in front of them as if they were looking directly into Alfred's shop. Bond stepped backwards into the workshop area. A few minutes later, he heard Goldfinger come into the shop. Good afternoon, said Goldfinger to Alfred. I saw a car outside. Is someone looking for a partner to play a game? The car belongs to Mr. Bond, replied Alfred. He's been a member here for many years. Bond, said Goldfinger. I met someone called Bond the other day. What's his first name? James. Sir, he's in the workshop now. Bond heard Goldfinger come to the door of the workshop. He pretended to be busy cleaning his golf club. I think that we have met before, said Goldfinger. Bond looked up with a surprised expression on his face. Oh, it's Gold, Goldman, a、uh, uh, Goldfinger. What are you doing here? I told you that I played here. Didn't Miss Masterton give you my message? I told her that I wanted to play a game of golf with you. I was going to play with Blacking this afternoon, but now I'll play with you instead. Bond pretended that he wasn't very interested, but I haven't got anyone to be my caddy. He said, "Blacking, can you find a caddy for Mister Bond?" Goldfinger asked Alfred. "Yes, sir." Then it's all arranged," said Goldfinger. "Well, okay," said Bond in a disinterested voice. But it's boring playing just for fun. I like playing for money. All right," said Goldfinger. "I have a suggestion. You took ten thousand dollars from me in Miami. If you win this game, I'll give you another ten thousand dollars. If you lose, you must give me my ten thousand dollars back." "I agree," said Bond. He looked cool and calm, but inside he felt very excited. This game was going to be a perfect opportunity to learn more about Auric Goldfinger. "I'll go and change my clothes," he said. Bond went to his car to get his bag. The man with the bowler hat was polishing Goldfinger's Rolls Royce with a cloth. He stopped polishing the car and watched Bond suspiciously. The man had a square face and dark, fierce eyes. He must be one of Goldfinger's Korean staff, thought Bond. Bond took off his shoes and his jacket, and put on a pair of special golf shoes and an old comfortable jacket. Then he went back into the shop. Alfred had found a caddy for him, a man called Hawker. Bond remembered Hawker. He'd first met the caddy at St. Mark's when Bond was a teenager. "Good afternoon, Hawker," said Bond. "Good afternoon, sir," replied Hawker, smiling. Goldfinger approached with his caddy, a man called Fuchs. Fuchs was carrying Goldfinger's new golf clubs in an expensive black leather bag. Goldfinger took out a club and a new golf ball. The name of the ball was printed on it in clear black letters and numbers. "I always use the same kind of ball," he said, "a Dunlop 65 number one." "What ball do you play with?" 
A Penfold Heart, replied Bond. Goldfinger and his caddy walked out onto the course, and Goldfinger placed his ball on the first tee. He made one or two practice swings with the club, then he hit the ball. It was an excellent shot, which went about 200 yards down the fairway towards the first hole. Now it was Bond's turn. He placed his ball on the tee and swung his club. But he hit the ball too hard. It went past Goldfinger's ball and landed in the long grass on the edge of a rough. Bond's second shot was even worse. He hit the ball into a bunker of sand. But Goldfinger was playing well. When he hit his ball again, it rolled easily along the ground to the first hole. I've got to do better than this, said Bond to Hawker. Don't worry, sir, replied Hawker. It's still early in the game. But Bond was worried. He knew that it was never too early to start losing, and he mustn't lose this game against Goldfinger. He had to win. Chapter 5. Playing to Win The golf course at Royal St. Mark's is very difficult. There are many areas of long, rough grass and bunkers full of sand. At the third hole of the course, Goldfinger hit his ball into the rough. The ball stopped beside a large tuft of grass. It was going to be very difficult for him to hit the ball because the tuft was in the way. Goldfinger looked at the ball for a moment. Then he stepped heavily on the tuft and made it flat. Now it was easy to hit the ball towards the hole. Bond frowned angrily. He'd seen how Goldfinger had flattened the tuft of grass. Goldfinger had cheated. But Bond also knew that he couldn't accuse Goldfinger of cheating. Goldfinger would deny it, and then he would accuse Bond of telling lies. As they approached the fifth hole, Bond was preparing for a difficult shot. He swung his club high in the air and thought about hitting the ball well. But suddenly Goldfinger made a sharp noise, and Bond swung his club in the wrong way. He hit the ball badly. He turned towards Goldfinger. His eyes were cold with anger. "'I am sorry,' said Goldfinger carelessly. I dropped my club. Don't do it again, said Bond. He handed his own club to Hawker and walked to the next hole without speaking. What company do you work for? asked Goldfinger suddenly. Bond tried to control his anger. He had to remember why he was playing golf with Goldfinger. Bond's mission was to find out more about Goldfinger. Universal export, he replied. And where are their headquarters? asked Goldfinger. London, Regent's Park. What do they export? Oh, all kinds of machines, as well as military weapons, said Bond. But the work isn't very interesting. I'm thinking about leaving the job. Oh, really? said Goldfinger. Bond waited for more questions, but Goldfinger didn't say anything more. At the sixth hole, Goldfinger cheated again. He made a bad shot, and his ball went into a bunker. It landed in a deep, soft part of the sand. But then Goldfinger didn't walk down into the bunker. He jumped down, and the sand beside the ball became flat. He'd made the ground level, so when he hit the ball again, it came out of the bunker easily. Bond was too far away to see what Goldfinger had done, but Bond's caddy... Hawker had seen how Goldfinger had cheated, and he was angry. Bond was losing the game because Goldfinger wasn't playing fairly. So Hawker made a decision. He would help Bond to win the game. Goldfinger and Bond were walking towards the tenth hole. What happened to that nice girl, Miss Masterton? asked Bond. Goldfinger stared straight in front of him. For a few minutes, he didn't speak. Then he said carelessly, She left my employment. Oh, really? Where did she go? I don't know, said Goldfinger, walking away. They continued playing. Goldfinger was still winning, but Bond played some excellent shots. At last, there were only two more holes to play, the 17th and the 18th, before the end of the game. At the 17th hole, Goldfinger hit his ball into deep, rough grass and lost it. Goldfinger and Fuchs started searching for the ball. Bond and Hawker searched too. 
Suddenly Bond trod on something. He bent down and looked in the long grass. Under his foot was a golf ball, a Dunlop 65. Here you are, he called to Goldfinger. Then he looked at the ball again. Oh, you play with a number one, don't you? Yes, called Goldfinger. Well, this is a number seven. Bond picked up the ball and showed it to Goldfinger. That isn't my ball, said Goldfinger. The ball was almost new. The words and numbers on it were clear. Bond put it in his pocket and went on searching for Goldfinger's ball. Suddenly, Fuchs called out, Here you are, sir. I found your ball. A number one Dunlop. Bond and Goldfinger walked over to where Fuchs was standing and pointing down at a ball. Bond looked at it closely. Yes, it was an almost new Dunlop number one, but it was lying in a very good position. Goldfinger could easily hit the ball into the hole from this position. How had the ball got there? Bond walked away, thinking carefully. He watched as Goldfinger hit the ball out of the rough. It was one of his best shots in the game. Bond smiled at Hawker and said, Goldfinger was very lucky to find his ball in that rough. It wasn't his own ball, sir, replied Hawker calmly. What do you mean? asked Bond. I saw him give money to Fuchs, sir, said Hawker. Fuchs had a new ball in his pocket. He dropped the ball down the leg of his trousers. Then he pretended that he'd found Goldfinger's lost ball. How can you be sure about that, Hawker? said Bond. Hawker smiled. Because I put your bag of golf clubs on top of his lost ball, he said. Bond looked surprised and shocked. I'm sorry, sir, Hawker went on, but I saw how he was cheating you. I had to do something to stop him. Bond laughed. Thank you, Hawker, he said. I know that Goldfinger has been cheating, but there's only one way that I can win now. I shall have to cheat too, and I'll have to cheat better than him. But how? Suddenly, Bond had an idea. The Dunlop number 7 golf ball, which he'd picked up, was in his pocket. Here, said Bond quietly to Hawker, take this. He put the Dunlop number 7 into Hawker's hand. After Goldfinger and I have hit our balls into the 17th hole, pick them up. Then give Goldfinger this number 7 Dunlop instead of his number 1 Dunlop. He mustn't see that you have changed the balls. The two balls look almost exactly the same, and the shape of the numbers 1 and 7 are similar. Goldfinger will start playing with a ball that isn't his own. That means he'll be breaking the rules of the game. That's a very clever trick, sir, said Hawker. At the 17th hole, Hawker did as Bond asked. He changed Goldfinger's Dunlop number one ball for the Dunlop number seven ball. Then he gave the Dunlop number seven to Goldfinger. Goldfinger was very pleased. He thought that he was winning. There was only the last hole to play, the 18th. Goldfinger placed his ball on the tee, and Bond watched him nervously. Surely Goldfinger would see that he was playing with a different ball. But Goldfinger didn't notice that anything was wrong. He swung his club and hit the ball well. It landed in a good position on the fairway. Good shot, said Bond in a pleased voice. Now he would win the game because Goldfinger had hit the wrong ball. Goldfinger had cheated Bond, but Bond had tricked him, and Goldfinger didn't know. Goldfinger hit his ball easily into the 18th hole. Bond didn't try to win. He hit his ball badly so that it went past the hole. He had to make more shots than Goldfinger so that he was the loser. He picked up his own ball and Goldfinger's ball out of the hole. Goldfinger's face was shining with triumph. He thought that he'd beaten Bond. It's clear that I'm a better player than you, he said. Yes, you are very good, said Bond, glancing at the two golf balls in his hand. Wait a moment, he said in a surprised voice. You play with a Dunlop number one, don't you? Yes, of course. Why? I'm sorry, but you've been playing with the wrong ball, said Bond. This is a Dunlop number seven, not a number one. He handed the ball to Goldfinger, and Goldfinger stared at it. 
His face went pale as he looked from the ball to Bond, and then back to the ball. I'm sorry. That means you've lost the game, said Bond softly. But, but, began Goldfinger angrily. Bond stood and waited, saying nothing. It was your caddy who gave me this ball at the seventeenth hole, said Goldfinger. He gave me the wrong ball. I'm sure that's not true, said Bond. Hawker, you didn't give Mr. Goldfinger the wrong ball by mistake, did you? No, sir, said Hawker. But perhaps the mistake happened when Mr. Goldfinger lost his ball in the long grass. Perhaps he picked up a Dunlop number seven instead of a number one. That's impossible, said Goldfinger angrily. You saw that my caddy found a number one, not a number seven. I'm afraid that I didn't look closely, replied Bond. Thanks for the game. We must play again one day. And he started to walk away. Goldfinger followed Bond slowly, his eyes staring coldly at Bond's back. Chapter Six: Dinner with Mr. Goldfinger. Bond went back to his hotel room and had a shower. While he was drying himself, a member of the hotel staff knocked at the door. "There's a phone message from Mr. Goldfinger, sir," he said. "He would like to invite you to dinner at his house tonight. He lives at the Grange in Reculver. Can you arrive at six thirty? Please tell Mr. Goldfinger that I'll be delighted to have dinner with him," replied Bond. He felt very pleased. He'd beaten Goldfinger twice, and now Goldfinger was interested in him. Goldfinger wanted to find out more about Bond. He wanted to find a way to fight him and win. Just after six o'clock, Bond drove to Reculver. He turned off the main road and followed the path leading up to Goldfinger's house. The Grange was a dark and ugly house. To the right of it, there were tall trees, and a tall factory chimney was behind them. Bond rang the front doorbell. The same Korean who had come to Royal St. Mark's with Goldfinger that afternoon opened the door. He was still wearing his bowler hat. He led Bond into a large, gloomy living room. A small fire was burning in the fireplace. Two armchairs were in front of the fire, and there was a tray of drinks on a table between them. There were stairs leading from the living room to the floor above. All the decorations and furniture in the room were dark and ugly. The Korean pointed silently to the drinks tray, then went out through a door at one side of the room. Bond heard a phone ringing somewhere in the house. Then there was the sound of a voice and footsteps coming down a passage. A door under the wooden staircase opened, and Goldfinger appeared. He was wearing a purple dinner jacket. It was very kind of you to come, Mister Bond," he said. "But I'm afraid that I have to leave you for a short time. I've just had a phone call. One of my Korean staff is in trouble with the police. I have to go and talk to them and find out what the problem is. My servant will drive me there. Please have a drink. I won't be more than half an hour. That's fine," said Bond. This room is very dark," said Goldfinger. "I'll put the lights on." He turned on a switch, and suddenly lights shone all round the room. Now it was as bright as a film studio. A few minutes later, Bond heard the sound of a car going away down the drive. He looked round the hall. Why had Goldfinger left him alone? Was it a trap? Bond looked at his watch. Five minutes had passed since Goldfinger had left. Bond decided to take a risk. Even if Goldfinger had prepared a trap, this was a good opportunity to look round the house while Goldfinger was away. The factory would be a good place to start. Bond opened the door that Goldfinger's servant had gone through and found himself in a passage. He walked along the passage and out through a door at the end. He was now standing in a courtyard. The long wall of the factory was on the other side of the courtyard. Bond crossed the courtyard and looked through a window into the factory. Inside Goldfinger's factory, there were two blast furnaces for melting metal. The whole building was lit with very bright lights. Under the powerful lights, Bond saw four Koreans working on Goldfinger's Rolls Royce Silver Ghost. 
They had taken the door off the right side of the car, and they were fitting a new panel of metal into it. Nothing interesting there, thought Bond. He went back to the living room and looked at his watch. He had ten minutes before Goldfinger returned. He decided to check the rooms upstairs. Bond climbed the stairs and walked along the passage. He opened doors and looked inside the rooms, but none of them had furniture in them. Suddenly, a large ginger red cat appeared. It rubbed its body against Bond's trouser legs and followed him. Bond opened a door at the end of the passage and found that he was in Goldfinger's bedroom. All the lights in the room were on. Bond looked around quickly, but he couldn't see anything unusual. The room was comfortable, with large cupboards and a small shelf of books beside the bed. Bond glanced at his watch again. There were only five minutes before Goldfinger came back. It was time to go. He took a last look around the room and moved to the door. Suddenly he stopped and listened carefully. There was a soft sound coming from one of the cupboards. It was the sound of a machine with an electric motor. Bond carefully opened the cupboard door. The noise of the motor was coming from behind some coats. He pushed them out of the way and saw three separate strips of film. They were moving down from three slots near the top of the cupboard and falling into a deep container. So this was the trap. Three cine cameras had been filming Bond from the time that Goldfinger had left the house. The cameras must be hidden somewhere in the living room, the courtyard outside the factory, and Goldfinger's bedroom. When Goldfinger had switched on the lights, he'd also switched on the cameras. Now Goldfinger would know that Bond had been looking round his house. What could Bond do? He heard a soft cry from beside the bedroom door. The cat. It had followed him into the room. Suddenly, Bond had an idea. He'd thought of a way to destroy the film, and Goldfinger would think that the cat had done it. Bond picked up the cat, holding the animal in his arms. He leant over the container and began to pick up the long strips of film. The bright light coming through the open cupboard door exposed the film. It destroyed the pictures on it. Now Goldfinger would have no pictures of Bond searching the house. When Bond was sure that all the film was exposed, he put the strips back into the container. Then he dropped the cat down on top of the strips of film. The cat couldn't get out of the deep container. It lay down on top of the strips and went to sleep. Goldfinger will think that the cat pushed open the door of the cupboard. Bond said to himself. Then it wanted to play with the moving strips of film, so it jumped into the container. He'll believe that the bright light in the room exposed the film. Bond ran back along the passage and down the stairs to the living room. He poured himself a drink, picked up a magazine, and sat down in one of the chairs. He didn't hear the sound of a car coming back, but suddenly the front door opened. Goldfinger had entered the room. "Hello," Bond said, turning round. "Is everything okay?" "Oh yes," said Goldfinger. "It was a misunderstanding. I talked to the police, and they let my servant go." You had to wait here alone. I'm sorry about that. I hope that you weren't bored. I'll just go upstairs and wash. Then we'll have dinner. Goldfinger walked up the stairs and along the passage. There was silence. Bond had another drink and read more of the magazine. Then he heard Goldfinger coming back down the stairs. He looked up. Goldfinger was standing in front of him with the ginger cat in his arms. Goldfinger found the cat in the cupboard. Bond said to himself, "He must have seen the exposed film too." Goldfinger rang a bell beside the fireplace. "Do you like cats?" he asked Bond. "They're okay," Bond replied. The door opened, and Goldfinger's Korean servant came into the room. He was wearing his bowler hat and a pair of shiny black gloves. "This is odd job," said Goldfinger, turning to Bond. I call him Odd Job because he does all kinds of work for me. He can't speak. Odd Job, show Mister Bond your hands. Odd Job pulled off his gloves and held out his hands. They were huge and strong, and all the fingers were the same length. Odd Job turned his hands over, and Bond saw that the servant had no fingernails. 
Down the edge of each hand there was a hard line of thick, shiny skin. Goldfinger pointed to the thick wooden banister that went up beside the stairs. He nodded to Odd Job, and the Korean servant walked over to the banister. He lifted his right hand high above his head and brought it down across the banister. The edge of his hand struck the banister like an axe. The powerful blow broke the banister and pieces of wood fell down onto the floor. His feet are as powerful as his hands, said Goldfinger. Odd job, the mantelpiece. He pointed to the heavy shelf of wood above the fireplace. It was about six inches higher than the top of Odd Job's bowler hat. Goldfinger nodded, and Odd Job leapt high in the air. His right foot struck the mantelpiece, and Bond heard a terrible noise as the mantelpiece broke. Bond stared at Odd Job in astonishment. He'd never met anyone like him before. Odd Job was tremendously strong. He was like a machine. Good, Odd Job said. Goldfinger, here. He threw the cat to Odd Job, who caught it quickly. I am tired of this animal. You may have it for dinner. Odd Job smiled a cruel smile. Bond felt disgusted, but he was careful not to show his feelings. Goldfinger suspected that Bond, not the cat, had found the film and destroyed it. Goldfinger was giving Bond a warning by showing Odd Job's strength and cruelty, and Bond understood this. Why does he always wear that bowler hat? Asked Bond calmly, looking at the servant. Odd Job, called Goldfinger as the servant was leaving the room. The hat. He pointed at a wooden panel on the wall near the fireplace. Odd Job was holding the cat under his left arm. He lifted his right hand. Took the hat off his head and threw it at the panel. There was a ringing sound. The edge of the bowler hat stuck deep in the panel. Goldfinger smiled at Bond. Odd Job's hat is made of a light but strong metal, he said. It's a very useful weapon. That blow would have smashed a man's head or cut his neck. Yes, indeed, said Bond politely. Odd Job pulled his hat out of the panel and went out. Time for dinner," said Goldfinger. He led the way through into a dining room. In the center of the room, a round table was prepared for a meal. The table had lighted candles, silver cutlery, and sparkling glasses on it. Bond and Goldfinger were served an excellent dinner by Goldfinger's Korean staff. "Your Rolls Royce is a beautiful car," said Bond. Was it made in about 1925? Yes," said Goldfinger. "I've had to make some changes to it. For example, I had to increase the power of the brakes. The body of the car is armor-plated, so it's very heavy." "What happens when you take the car to Europe?" asked Bond. "Isn't it too heavy for a plane?" "I book a whole plane for myself," replied Goldfinger. I book with the Silver City Company. Their planes fly from Ferryfield Airport. I go to Europe twice a year on golfing holidays, so they know me well. In fact, I'm going to Europe tomorrow. They talked about money and Bond's work at Universal Export. Bond told Goldfinger that he wanted to leave the company. Bond was still hoping that Goldfinger would offer him a job, but Goldfinger didn't seem very interested. After dinner. Goldfinger got up from the table and went towards the front door. Bond followed and held out his hand. "Well, many thanks for the excellent dinner," he said. "Perhaps we'll meet again one day." Goldfinger looked closely at Bond and shook his hand slowly. "I am sure that we will meet again," he said. All the way back to his hotel, Bond thought about what Goldfinger had said. What did he mean? Was he going to make contact with Bond again? Bond decided that he would follow Goldfinger to Europe, but he would have to be careful, very careful.